Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. just a great things so through things like this medium. So uh, I, I really am happy to have this invitation. And it's really great that you've uh, done this Down Ancient Trails uh, um, seminar series, uh, because you can see that so many wonderful people have been engaged in it. And it looks like you have great groups of people coming online. And so this is a new forum for communication. and. Uh, it really makes me happy that we can communicate like this. And I just want to say right from the get-go that, uh, yes, in fact, I had uh, worked in India for a very long time. And, and uh, I will, of course, center this talk on Arabia, but I will have to give you some background to why I even went to Arabia. So I'll give you a little bit of some background on, uh, on India. And I'm here to talk about uh, out of Africa dispersals, which of course has always been a hot topic in paleoanthropology and human evolutionary studies. And so I will give you my spin on things uh, with some of the work that we have uh, been doing in this uh, so-called Southern dispersal zone from Arabia down into South Asia. And like I said, I will concentrate on Arabia, but I'll give you some of that background information as well. Um, and today, I've, I've broken up this talk into three parts, and I'm going to uh, center on three topics today. And I will give you that background uh, of, of Southern dispersals and you know, what that's all about. And I will concentrate on the last 200,000 years, even though some of my own work and that of my colleagues goes way back up to a million years ago or, or more, what I'd really like to focus on is the last 200,000 years. And I'll give you some of that background information. Uh, and again, I'll touch on that work that we did in India and why it was so crucial, why we took a step towards the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, we have been working very much in the Arabian Peninsula, full throttle for the last 10 years, and I'll give you an overview of that work. And uh, to conclude the third part of this talk, I thought it'd be fun to just give you some snippets of some of the work that we're doing right now, current work, ongoing work, and what we intend to do in the future with respect to the Southern Dispersal Zone. Um, let me just uh, kick off with the idea that this is all about teamwork, too. And, and I'm very proud and happy to be invited to give this talk. But behind all the work that I will talk about, there are lots of people, right from the very people that are digging the sites, uh, through the, the people that are doing executing uh, specialized aspects to the field work, uh, people who are doing all of the analyses, whether it's on artifacts or some of the scientific studies that we do in laboratories, and so on and so forth. So, so we, we have big international interdisciplinary teams. So everything I'm going to be talking about today is not just about what I have done, but it's really all about the teamwork. It's the people behind these projects that really matter. And I really want to emphasize that because uh, this is an international group of people. And if you look at some of my publications, you will see that I very rarely 
solo author anything. Uh, it is a, it's a wide interdisciplinary group of people, and, uh, and hopefully you'll see that, um, you know, it's very integrative in terms of the people that are do executing this work. And I can't possibly name everyone, and I can't possibly list all the publications, but I'm also very happy if people after this lecture want to contact me and provide you with some of that literature. I'm very happy to do that. Um, the work that I do and the work that I'll be talking about today is very interdisciplinary. At the core of it is interdisciplinarity. I'm an archaeologist by training. I'm a Paleolithic archaeologist. Um, but I realized that in order to tell the story of human evolution, how we evolved, how we changed, how we are continuing to change, um, it's, a, it's a story that no archaeologist can tell uh, on the whole. And so that requires that we bring to the table specialists in different fields. And if you look at the literature that I have uh, published, you can see it has a very interdisciplinary approach. So we, of course, have a, a wide array of archaeologists, but it also includes biological anthropologists, geneticists, and all types of people that are doing earth sciences approaches. So, so the, the publications tend to be very interdisciplinary rather than highly focused. I mean, we obviously do highly focused publications, but um, with respect to big picture kinds of things, it really requires that we get out of our narrow fields and really talk to people from um, different disciplines. And that's uh, something that I do routinely. Um, and you'll see, I hope, through some of the field work and some of the results that I'm presenting today, you'll see how interdisciplinary it really is. On that interdisciplinary side, I, I just want to list some of the specialties that we actually employ in our work. And you can see a wide variety of different techniques and methods that we incorporate in our work. Um, here in Jena, for example, we have labs doing all sorts of things. But our, our projects are bigger than just one institution. We, we reach out to many institutions and organizations around the world, and we bring specialists to, to the table in order to tell a very rich, I think, story about, about human evolution. And so these are just some of the techniques we bring to bear on the archaeological record. And I'm also very happy to talk to uh, some of you if these are the kinds of methods that you'd like to develop. And I can either help with that kind of thing or I can put you in touch with some of the specialists that we, we uh, employ on our projects. Um, so that brings me sort of, sort of on the way of sort of the uh, interdisciplinary approach, the approach that we take to things, it brings me to the first part of this lecture, and that is on the background to the southern dispersals. And this is a topic that's been very near and dear to my heart for a very long time. It's something that I've been working on for a while. Uh, and it all began actually in India. Um, I, I was very interested when I first started to go to India uh, working with uh, Professor Padaya at Deccan College on the Lower Paleolithic, the Acheulean, of course. Uh, but then later on, uh, I had developed interest into the question of when did modern humans, Homo sapiens, get to South Asia? And uh, I, I will give you some overview of some of that work in South Asia and why I went uh, one step backwards, if you will, towards the Arabian Peninsula. And I will give you more detail about what we're doing in Arabia, what we intend to do in Arabia, to focus on this question of the last 200,000 years. When did modern humans get out of Africa? The timing of those dispersals. But also, as you see here, the roots, the, the carters of expansions of modern humans. And this is a big, 
open topic. It's something I've been publishing on for a while together with my colleagues, but there are many things we don't know about out of Africa dispersals. Arabia, I believe, is key to that. Obviously, if you just look at this map, obviously it connects Africa with the Levant and then on to places like South Asia. So, so I do think Arabia in particular is a really important geographic uh, place in order to understand dispersal processes. Um, and before I launch into uh, some of that field work, I just want to give you this background information. Obviously, this is a chart over the last two million years, and we know there were a lot of human ancestors involved in terms of uh, 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 out of Africa dispersals. First, you have populations of Homo erectus or Homo erectus-like species uh, with an origin in Africa and then coming out of Africa at a very early date. Some of our earliest dates in Asia now are more than two million years in China. So we know early hominins are making it to Eastern Asia by 2.1 million years ago. Uh, we also have the rise in, of, uh, and speciation of Homo heidelbergensis uh, in Africa. And then another major movement, very likely, out of Africa in the last five, 600,000 years ago or so. Um, and then finally, of course, you have our own species. And we think uh, our own species now uh, arose in Africa about 300,000 years ago and then moved out of Africa. And I'm talking about the, the timing of those movements out of Africa for Homo sapiens and what our field work is telling us. And so obviously this is a very rich and complicated story. And we, of course, nowadays have all this wonderful genetic evidence about interbreeding. And the whole Southern dispersal zone plays a very major role in these questions about the rise of multiple species in Africa and the dispersals into Eurasia. And that's a, a topic I will, I, I've been writing about for a long time, and I'll touch on, obviously, by focusing on the last 200,000 years. And just a few slides about the work in, in, in South Asia and why I think that's so important to what we're thinking about and what we're doing in Arabia. Um, and of course, we know now um, that in, in South Asia, we have some very early archeological sites, thanks to people like Shanti and Akalesh, who have uh, identified some of the earliest Acheulean sites in, in South Asia. We know sites are, exceed more than a million years in South Asia. And these are really terrific, wonderful sites of the Acheulean period, where you get these hand axe and cleaver industries. And so these industries in South Asia are similar, of course, to what we see in Arabia. And I'll show you some pictures of that. But also uh, they relate to some of the earliest Acheulean industries in, in Africa. And these obviously were probably being made by archaic hominin groups. Uh, and in South Asia, we have uh, the Narmada hominin, which is probably making some of these Acheulean technologies. But one of the things that happened to us working in South Asia is that we were working in northern, northern, northern India and we were finding some of these evolved or very young Acheulean records. And when we dated them, lo and behold, we were very surprised to be getting dates like 130,000 years ago. And so we had these very finely made, diminutive hand axes and cleavers side by side with the scoidal and Lavalwa industries, which we normally associate with the Middle Paleolithic. Um, and so there's a very important transition, I think, in India, which people have been talking about for a long time, but for which we need really better chronologies 
of these industries where we have mixtures of, of hand axes and cleavers and lavalwa, lavalwa uh, cores and discoidal cores, and we really need to understand this a lot more. And unfortunately, we don't have lots of dates. Um, we have some now, unfortunately, but we also don't have very much in the way of archaic hominins themselves. And so more fossils obviously are really needed. But we, of course, think that archaic hominins are at least responsible for the production of some of these industries. And so we have a very young Acheulean. And that's very important for thinking about out of Africa dispersals and the movement of Homo sapiens to South Asia. Because if archaic hominins are really around in South Asia at a very young period, well, if sapiens is, is getting to places like South Asia at around 120,000 years ago, or perhaps before, then they must be encountering these archaic groups. And this is a fascinating topic, which of course has been a big topic in Northern Eurasia um, because ancient DNA has been very much possible. And so we see a lot with respect to interbreeding of Homo sapiens with archaic populations. Um, moving on to uh, Homo sapiens itself, you know, when I came into this whole story, uh, when I started to work in South Asia and was thinking about, you know, what we had uh, with respect to our middle Paleolithic sites, there was a very predominant theory uh, at that point in time. And, and that is this one, this idea that modern humans, Homo sapiens, came out of Africa 60,000 years ago, and they rapidly dispersed all across Eurasia, uh, and they reached all the way over to Australia by 50 to 60,000 years ago. So there was, there was, a, there was an event where, where Homo sapiens populations came out of Africa and they got all the way to Australia very quickly. And because geneticists have been telling this story of this very rapid dispersal, the idea was that modern humans, well, how did they get there so rapidly to places like Australia? Well, the argument went that they must have used the coasts. And so you had all of these arguments about the rapid coastal dispersal of Homo sapiens to all the way over to Australia. And, and you can see this idea of this sort of coastal superhighway. And um, when I was reading about this and, and encountering the archaeology of places like South Asia and today in Arabia, it, this kind of account wasn't very satisfying to me. Um, and as you'll see, I, I, we've disputed almost every element to this particular theory. Um, now, while the dispersal of modern humans, genetic coalescence ages do in fact seem to go back to around 60,000 years ago, that, 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 that standard deviation on those dates is actually quite wide. And I think archaeology and the fossil evidence really speak to this, whether or not this is correct. And this is why I put question marks on this slide because let's look at this, some of the information on the ground relative to this very popular theory. And when I was working uh, in India, in Southern India originally, uh, excavating some sites uh, at Jalapuram in the Jarrero River Valley down south, um, we, we were, we, I originally went to the Kurnu uh, district because I wanted to look at these so-called upper Paleolithic sites of, of South Asia uh, and try to relate the upper Paleolithic to other parts of the world. Well, to make a very long story short, we never found the upper Paleolithic of the Kurnul district. But what we did find was a very rich middle Paleolithic record. Um, and when we first, first started to work in this particular valley, I was very struck by the fact that villagers there were excavating 
some of ash deposits, volcanic ash deposits. And you can see this depicted right here in this middle slide where you see Toba ash. This is the, the, the young Toba tuff uh, from the Toba volcanic super eruption of 74,000 years ago. And it was thought, previous ideas were that when this volcano in Indonesia erupted, the super volcano, all populations of Eurasia, all hominins, would have gone extinct. So if you look at this upper left-hand chart, we have the, vo the volcanic winter, what's called the, the volcanic winter, this Toba super eruption, and any hominin species that was around in places like South Asia would have gone extinct. So the theory went. Except that the archaeology that we were doing in the Jurero River Valley showed us that we had the Middle Paleolithic sites above the ash after 74,000 years ago. And when we excavated through the ash, we found Middle Paleolithic sites before the ash. And so we had these Middle Paleolithic hominins that seemed to be surviving the Toba volcanic super eruption, not going extinct necessarily. And it was all Middle Paleolithic. And when we looked at the pre-Toba ash sites, the Middle Paleolithic sites, before the ash and after the ash, we argued that Middle Paleolithic hominins survived the Toba super eruption, which countered to the very popular theory about the volcanic winter then. Now, we had people like Chris Clarkson that came to the table, and he was doing worldwide quantitative analyses of Middle Paleolithic technologies. And when Chris looked at some of our Jawaporum Middle Paleolithic, he argued that that Middle Paleolithic was actually similar to technologies that we were finding in sub-Saharan Africa made by Homo sapiens. And so in our science article that we put out in 2009, we just had a few lines that said, hominins not only survived the volcanic winter in India, they also might have been Homo sapiens itself. This got me into huge debates about Southern dispersals, because here we were arguing that Homo sapiens might have been in India previous to 74,000 years ago. And again, long story short, that created huge debates, not only with archeologists, but with people interested in human evolution in general, uh, and with geneticists, and even with earth scientists and particularly climatologists who wanted to see this as a big catastrophic event. Um, we verified that. We just recently published an article uh, in the north, in northern India, where we argued again that hominins survived the Toba super eruption. And again, we argued we think this is Homo sapiens. We don't have their fossils but we're arguing that some of the technologies are very coincident with what we see in Arabia and Africa. And we now know there are fossils of Homo sapiens out of Africa, not only earlier than 60,000 years ago, but very early, way before the Toba super eruption. And so we think that this argument makes a lot of sense. We even see fossils of early Homo sapiens in places like Eastern Asia. And so we think we have some very interesting evidence about the Middle Paleolithic in South Asia, which again, I will relate to some of our work uh, that we're doing in Arabia. And the last bit of the work that I just want to introduce to you is some of the work that we not only did in Southern uh, India at Jawaporam, uh, on the last 35,000 years, but we've now turned some of our efforts, thanks to some of our colleagues uh, in, in, that we're working with very closely in Sri Lanka, we're now turning to some of the caves and some of the open air sites there, 
And we've now dated some of those sites, some of these microlithic sites, to 45, perhaps as early as 48,000 years ago. And here we have highly sophisticated technologies, microlithic uh, technologies, some of these backed industries, different, of course, from the Middle Paleolithic. Uh, and we've got all sorts of wonderful information about these bone tools and things like uh, beads, symbolic items. And so we seem to be entering a period that is, is different from what we saw earlier. Uh, and we've been investigating this now uh, from Jawa Purim in our early days all the way right up to now. And so we seem to have something slightly different going on uh, here at this time period. And we've synthesized, uh, of course, this information uh, about South Asia. And here you can, can see the evidence is, is generally very good. And of course, this has been filling in. This is an old slide. Uh, the evidence has been filling in more and more and more as time goes on. And so what we think we have is this late Acheulean industry. We think we've got some very interesting Middle Paleolithic technologies early on uh, that are also overlapping with uh, these late Acheulean industries. These late Acheulean industries eventually disappear completely to be overtaken, if you will, by the Middle Paleolithic, right up to the Toba event and post-Toba, only to be replaced eventually by these microlithic industries at about 45,000 years ago. So this is very interesting uh, and important evidence with respect to southern dispersals and what we're thinking about the movement of modern humans and who they may be encountering along the way. And this gives you a context to understand what I'll be talking about uh, relative to Arabia. Uh, but the only thing I want to note here, this is Paul Meller's uh, rendition of the debate that we got into. This is with archaeology, with, of course, genetics and and fossils as part of the background here. I, I don't want to um, just give my own theories and hypotheses, but I do want to point out to you these are all subject to debate. And you can see here that we still are debating some of this. And I, I don't want, uh, and I'm simply indicating to you that there are other theories out there. Uh, we, as you'll see in a moment, I think the evidence from Arabia is shoring up some of these interpretations, but I just throw that out there, and I'm happy to entertain questions, of course, on this kind of topic. So that background uh, gives you some information for you to understand some, what, some of the things that we'll be talking about now in the second part of this talk on the Arabian uh, peninsula. And so uh, we've been working in Arabia. Um, I, my, my first visit there was back in 2001. But for the last 10 years or so, we've had a very large international group working in Arabia. Uh, a couple seasons over the last, uh, every year over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and we have collected all sorts of new data working side by side, mainly with our colleagues in Saudi Arabia. And again, this is part of a large group of people. We've been publishing a lot on this. Uh, this is not all my work. Uh, it's the work of, of my very close colleagues. And so I'll give you sort of an overview of what we've been learning there. But as you can see here, Arabia is such a striking place. Um, these dunes are massive. Um, but you can see these jeeps are actually sitting on old lake beds, which I'll, I'll talk a lot about. And this kind of striking change with respect, respect to lake beds and dunes is giving us really excellent information about environmental change and what effect did that have on out-of-Africa dispersals. 
And thinking, uh, talking about Arabia, you've also got to, of course, think about biogeography and environmental change. And the slide here on the left is depicting current annual rainfall. Obviously, uh, places like the Sahara and Arabia are arid, hyper-arid landscapes uh, that people have a very difficult time living in. Um, you know, pastoral groups do do it, settled people around the oases do do it. But if you're a hunter-gatherer trying to make your way in these landscapes, you know, aridity, uh, and hyper-aridity is not such a great place to be living. Um, but these were not always deserts, as you will see. Um, but, you know, there's some similarity, obviously, in, in some of these biogeographic zones. So the Sahara is similar to the flora and fauna of Arabia. And in some ways, if you're looking at Sahara, you're also looking at Arabia. They're almost one blended geographic zone, biogeographic zone, if you will. So in this sense, there's no Africa, there's no Asia, because, you know, from a, from a geographic standpoint, you see the biogeography of the Sahara and Arabia is fairly similar. Um, and one of the fascinating things for me is to sort of think about that process of the movement out of Africa and thinking about the changes of environments, but also with the background that I've given you on, on South Asia, of course, modern humans, when they were coming out of Africa, they would have been encountering a very different situation once they got to places like India and South Asia. That's what people, uh, biogeographers, tend to call the Oriental Zone, the indo mala Malay zone, where you get very similar forests and, and fauna in South Asia and Southeastern Asia. Um, and if you look at this current annual rainfall map on the left, and you look at Sahara and Arabia, and you take a look at India and Sri Lanka, you can see immediately that the annual rainfall is different, of course, completely different. You know, you have similarity with respect to the Tar Desert, the Great Indian Desert, but most ecological zones of South Asia are very different. They're much more, <clears throat> they're lusher, there's much more rainfall, you get forests, you get savannas, you get grasslands, you get tropical landscapes. And so we don't have that as much, of course, in terms of the contemporary world of Arabia. But if you look at the past, you will see how similar some things were. And I will come back to that. Now, when we started to work in, in Saudi Arabia, um, the Saudis uh, granted us this permission to work very widely across the country. And that was wonderful uh, to do. We have something like seven project areas that we've been working north to south, east to west. Um, and we've been working in even uh, additional areas uh, um, in addition to what you see actually depicted here as the red dots. And so this allowed us to sample different landscapes, but it also allowed us to sample sites of different ages because not any one area has the entire sort of uh, cultural chronology within it. So it's been great to move around uh, all across the Arabian Peninsula and sample the archeological record of Arabia. I won't talk about some of the early sites, but we think we have sites perhaps as old as 800,000 years ago uh, in Arabia. And we're working on sites all the way up through time. We're even working on a Neolithic and, and historic sites as well. So we're looking at the entire cultural span. Um, but this um, is some information. Where do we start? Well, we start by looking at what we have relative to the literature, of course. Uh, and these maps are uh, uh, from an article 
uh, that uh, myself and Hugh Gruca uh, wrote a few years back, where we pulled together some of the literature of what people thought were lower Paleolithic, middle Paleolithic, and late Paleolithic sites. And this was all done from a typological standpoint. Prior, the, prior to 2011, there was not a single stratified, dated archeological site in Arabia. And so we've been very lucky now since 2011 to ourselves plus other colleagues publishing on stratified dated sites, but all of the sites in Arabia were only known from the surface. Uh, there were some excavations, but the dates didn't really work out very well for the most part. Um, and so the Paleolithic was only known from a typological sense. But nevertheless, it was very interesting and very important to, to put together some of this literature, because even today, some of the pictures on the, on the bottom, you can see, of course, there's big variations in some of the stone tool technologies that we see from the Acheulean, uh, in the middle, some refit uh, Lavawa core to these, uh, to these uh, blade and bladelet-like assemblages that we think associate with much later periods of time. So there's a relative cultural chronology that's possible there, but of course it's very important to find stratified datable sites as well. Um, and so uh, I will show you some of that as, uh, in, uh, coming up soon. But with respect to where we start our work, um, we, we, we started our work with some computer modeling. We worked with uh, some modeling groups that were simulating environments worldwide. But we asked them, of course, to look at uh, Arabia through time. And again, there's that sort of image of the current annual rainfall and what we think of Arabia as today. Uh, this arid and hyper-arid situation. Um, and then we asked uh, some of these modelers to look at time slices retroactively, looking in the past. And you can see on the right here, looking at the last interglacial, that is around, let's say, around 125,000 years ago. And you can see that when you're looking at Sahara and Arabia, they would have been much wetter in the past, 125,000 years ago. And so this is what we generically call Green Sahara, Green Arabia. These are periods of time when these zones experienced much higher rainfall regimes. And in fact, Indian Ocean monsoons might have been penetrating Arabia much more. You would have had the African monsoons moving up into Arabia and even the Mediterranean westerlies moving across northern Arabia. And so in the past, the Arabia was much greener than it is today, the stereotype that we have of Arabia today. Okay, And those greener periods, of course, with higher rates of rainfall, would have created the network of rivers and lakes. And so we have a team of people working on satellite imagery and GIS, and they have mapped, some of our London colleagues have mapped um, Ara the Arabian Peninsula. And as you can see, this is most striking to me, even today, you can see a whole network of drainages. And on the left, these are just the major drainages of Arabia. Um, and you can see immediately, if you were, to, if you were a hunter-gatherer, you would be using this drainage network, not only for fresh water, but for migrating across the peninsula. And then when you zoom in on a particular area on the right-hand side, this is the Mundafan Lake down in the empty quarter, the Rub al-Khali, one of the most inhospitable deserts in the world. Well, when you look at satellite imagery, you can actually see it was full of lakes and, pet, uh, and rivers. And so the upper, upper slide, the upper right-hand corner, 
you can see that drainages, rivers were draining in to the Mundafan Lake. Uh, and then you zoom in even more, and you can see that this lake at its height was about 20 kilometers in length. And that is really, of course, most remarkable. Um, and because when we go out there, and you'll see in a moment, when we survey, we find archeological sites on different shorelines of these lakes. And so this satellite imagery work has been most fascinating because um, the people working on it uh, have published with us and argued that there were up to 10,000 paleo lakes, 10,000 paleo lakes in Arabia. Now, of course, these 10,000 paleo lakes would have been around at different times. They weren't all there at the same time. But what that means is we have a sequence of paleo lakes through time and a sequence of river drainages through time. And this is just to show you, again, zooming in on a particular area, the Nafud Desert in northern Saudi Arabia. Here's one of the project areas that we were working in, in the Nafud Desert. And you can see it outlined on the left slide. And when you look on the right-hand slide, all these dots represent particular lakes, it's lakes that we can see from satellite imagery. Okay, so that's extraordinary because right now we have a very much sand seas. These are dune landscapes. Um, but in the past, you have all of these potential rivers and lakes. And so this is all desktop work that can be done to show you there was some level of humidity in the past. But of course, there's nothing like getting out there and doing the work. And usually we jeep out there to, to find sites, but thanks to the Saudi Geological Survey, they have provided helicopters sometimes, and so we can penetrate the desert much easier and quicker, thanks to the help, use of the helicopter. And we look for these paleo lakes. And so on the left, the lower left um, uh, image, you can see these, of course, massive dunes in the Nafud Desert, but you can see that, that lower, darker area, which represents one of those dots on a map, one of those paleo lakes. And of course, when we drive there or we take the helicopter there, um, our crew can verify whether or not that was in fact a paleo lake on the map. And the accuracy of these maps is running about 90, 92%. Sometimes we have false positives, but mostly they are correct. And in fact, when, we, when a Pele Lake is identified, we go out there and we verify that 90% of the time, that is an accurate rendition of what is on the ground. And of course, when you send archeologists out there, the, the fascinating thing about finding those paleo lakes is 70% of the time we're out there, on the few hundred lakes that we've been out there, 70% of the time you find some form of archeology span or fossils on those paleo lakes. And people uh, argued, even though we had so much archeology span on some of these lakes, they argued, well, these lakes may have not all been fresh water, maybe they were very salty and really people couldn't live out there or humans couldn't live out there. But we have pretty much uh, proven that at least some of these lakes were in fact fresh water, deep fresh water resources for hominins and of course for mammals. There's some very good environmental evidence, which I won't go over all the details, but we have proven the fact that these were not all salty lakes. And so this was very important, of course, when you're thinking about out of African dispersals. You have the rivers, you have the lakes, and you have potable, drinkable water. And not only do you have the drinkable water, of course, if you think about it, animals are also going to be following these resources when they come into being. And so we have some wonderful fossil sites, um, in particular one very old one between 
500 and 300,000 years ago, uh, which I won't go over in great detail. But you can see that the point I want to make here is that this must have been a freshwater and deep lake because we have uh, animals like ducks on, on these lakes and all sorts of microorganisms, but we also have hippos on some of these sites. And so, of course, hippos need deep water uh, in order to live. They cannot live exposed to the sun for very long periods of time. They need this, this uh, kind of deep freshwater lake. And lo and behold, we find hippo fossils on some of these sites, even the younger ones. Um, and so this is telling us that um, mammals were attracted to these zones and that Arabia acted as a crossroads to continents, that uh, any animal that was in the Levant or in Africa would have been migrating into Arabia when these rivers and lake, ne lake networks were operational. And so uh, with respect to the, the cultural chronology, when we get out there, and look at some of these lakes depicted in white and white outline, we can see that some of these Acheulean sites associate with the lakes themselves. And so we can tell, of course, that Acheulean hominins are dispersing across this area, whether from Africa or the Levant. They are moving, they are penetrating the heart of Arabia into these lacustrine zones. And so we think we have archaic hominins, of course, getting into Arabia. Now, most uh, interestingly, they, uh, as, as you probably, many of you un understand and know, not only do they need, you know, uh, resources to subsist on and potable water, but they also need raw materials. And this is the most fascinating site right in the heart of Arabia. It's a place called Safaka or Dawadmi. Uh, and this is a whole landscape of volcanic dikes like you have in southern India, the fascinating dike landscape that I've actually worked in in southern India. Well, you have that same kind of dike landscape in Arabia. And when we've done surveys of these dikes that you can see in the foreground and the background of, of this photograph, um, not only did hominins get into the center of Arabia, but what did they do? They followed these raw material sources. And so we have done surveys, and these, these areas in the red here, in the lower left-hand corner in red, are these dikes. And when we've done surveys, we have actually found Acheulean sites relative to these dike landscapes. And we have one to 200 kilometers of Acheulean sites mapped relative to these dikes. So we can see Acheulean hominins moving way deep into the center of Arabia, but they're also utilizing these dikes. So they're following rivers, and dike landscapes for raw materials. And of course, what are they doing with the raw materials? Well, they're making these hand axe industries. And if so, this is really fascinating because other than in um, South Africa or Southern Africa, there are very few places in the world where we have a continuous sequence of Acheulean sites over such a wide landscape. And like my work in India, um, I was very surprised when some of the first uh, dates were coming out of this particular site, the Safaka site, which we test excavated. The site was excavated back in the 80s, um, but we went back there to, to look at the stratigraphy and try to obtain accurate dates. And I was surprised because once we dated this site, our ages converged on 225,000 years ago or so. And so this was, again, another young phase of the Acheulean. Uh, and now we're doing additional work, additional dating, 
and we're getting repeated ages of very young Acheulean industries, not old, old ones, but rather young ones. So we think archaic hominins, again, are occupying this landscape, perhaps when Homo sapiens itself was speciating and moving across places like Africa and even outside of Africa. So we have these Acheulean toolkits. And Safaka is a really an amazing site. It's like the Eastern Port Quarry, which I worked on in southern India, where you get these big boulders where huge flakes were being taken off of these big, massive boulders. And then these big flakes were then turned into things like hand axes and cleavers, very similar to what you see in the Levant and in South Asia itself. And so moving up on in time, uh, we also uh, are looking, of course, at the Middle Paleolithic. Uh, the dates of the Middle Paleolithic converge around 200,000 years ago to up to around 55,000 years ago. And as you can see in this map, the Middle Paleolithic sites are found across Arabia. And again, uh, we think that the drainage networks are being used for the expansion of these Middle Paleolithic hominins. Now, most of our Middle Paleolithic sites tend to be younger than the, the 200,000 date, and I will show you some examples of them. In uh, marine isotope stage five, that is after 125,000 years ago, that's when we have the majority of our Middle Paleolithic sites so far. Um, and so this is really interesting because you can see that the Middle Paleolithic of Arabia is very rich, like it is in places like the Levant. And so we've got these classic uh, Middle Paleolithic industries with Lavawa and discoidal core technologies. Uh, and they are, of course, variable across the peninsula uh, through time and space. And so I thought I'd just give you an example of what one of these Middle Paleolithic stone toolkits look like. This one we've uh, dated to 75,000 years ago uh, through luminescence dating, and it's a place called the uh, Juba Paleo Lake, which is also up north in the Nafud uh, Desert. And you can see some of these classic Middle Paleolithic technologies found at this site. Um, but looking at another site, uh, Awusta, uh, in the heart of the Nafud Desert itself, we dated to about 85,000 years ago. Uh, and these are late deposits, which we call marls. You can see these very compact marls within uh, these dune deposits. But this is really interesting because on some of these sites, like Wusta, we actually find fragments of, of fossils. And, uh, a site, and any find of a fossil, of course, is very important because most of what we know about Arabia comes through its stone toolkits. But so we will take any bone that we can actually find. And our paleontologists have reconstructed from this very fragmentary evidence that we have savanna and grassland taxa, but we also have lack of stream uh, uh, mammals as well. So you get an image of what it was like for some of these hominin groups moving across these uh, middle uh, across these ancient lake landscapes and the kind of animals that would have been available to them. Now. Awusta is quite a famous one for us because it really nailed the whole question of the association of the Middle Paleolithic. And uh, there's a particular article on this site and the fossil find. This is the very first hominin fossil of Arabia. And it's a middle finger bone of a hominin and our biological anthropologists studied this in great detail and we think this is uh, a finger bone of homo sapiens and not neanderthals and importantly for me it associates with the middle paleolithic and so here we have a one-to-one -one association 
between Homo sapiens and the Middle Paleolithic of Arabia. And going back in time, this is an unpublished site, we hope to soon get published. Um, we not only have the stone tools and some fossils uh, associated with these ancient lakes, but lo and behold, we even have the footprints of hominins. And in this article, which I said is yet unpublished, we have made an argument, this is Homo sapiens itself, not Neanderthals. Um, and this is a fascinating site. I, I don't have time to go into it, but maybe some of your questions, I can address some of this, but we even have the trackways of elephants and camels, wild camel, of course, uh, at a site like this. So this is giving you a snapshot of time, what it was like about 120,000 years ago in Arabia along one of these Paleolink situations. And putting this all together, what we've been arguing over the years now uh, is for the expansion of Homo sapiens out of Africa into Arabia many times in the past, not just once, 60,000 years ago. We have been arguing, as you can see in the, this complicated graph, the red bars represent dated Middle Paleolithic sites. And you can see, hopefully, that they associate with some periods of time denoted by the green vertical bars that are green periods, wetter periods in the past when these lakes and rivers would have been operational. And so when these lakes and rivers come, they, they, they promote or they influence dispersals and expansions across Arabia. And so we think that this denotes a multiple migrations model out of Africa and across a place like Arabia. And this all is occurring in the middle Paleolithic. There's no sign of an upper, a classic upper Paleolithic in our project areas. And so when we're thinking about this and dispersals out of Africa, um, we, we have easy movements, if you will, from the Nile River Valley up through the Sinai, which were connected by rivers and lakes, up into the Levant, and then down into Arabia. And there's a particular corridor that gets into the, the food, which we've named the Tabuk corridor. And so you can see all these blue dots on the, on the, on the map on the left represent potential rivers and lakes. And so you can see the middle Paleolithic sites denoted in white easily can get into the heart of these so-called arid landscapes. And so we have multiple routes across Africa, the Sinai, and Arabia. And so this is a, probably a very complicated situation and not at all straightforward. And this is just trying to synthesize some of this information a little bit more. These are some of the Middle Stone Age and Mysterian and Middle Paleolithic sites of Arabia, Africa, and South Asia. And the argument that I want to make here is that the grand majority, if not all the evidence that we have along the Indian Ocean Rim is interior inland. It is not coastal. And so we think that migrations and dispersals were mainly terrestrial, inland, and not coastal. And something to really interesting to think about uh, is that, you know, I've been talking a lot about humidity and, and rainfall, but what happens to these groups? What happens to these mammals? What happens to these hominins when it all goes bad? Because you have a fluctuation between humidity and aridity through time, and you would not want to be caught in places like the empty quarter where all the lakes are drying up. 
And so we think this led to contractions of populations and perhaps even extinctions. And of course, some of these populations would have moved to more favorable zones like South Asia. So when you have highly arid landscapes, these are not great places for hunter-gatherers, of course. So populations in South Asia, when you have aridity in places like Sahara and Arabia, it's still not terrible in South Asia. You have changes of ecosystems, of course, but they all don't go completely bad. And that's why I think in places like South Asia, you see a lot more continuity than you would see in a place like Arabia. Okay, and just the last few slides. This is some information uh, on our current and future research. Where are we going with all of this? And we've been working on the Southern dispersal question for a long time. Um, and we are still going full throttle on it, of course. Um, but I just thought I'd show you some of our active research and where we are going now in the next few years. And we have, for the last uh, three years, we've been very much working on this project, uh, a Leverhulme project with some of my colleagues. And it is to tie the Arabian situation, the chronologies and the environments and the, the cultural uh, chronology into the Levant. So we want to compare and contrast Levantine and Arabian uh, situations and see how similar or different they are. And this has been a project that's been going full tilt for a few years, like I said, and hopefully in the next year or two, you'll start seeing some integration between the Levantine and the Arabian situation. The other thing that uh, we're doing, we've, it's only been uh, a season, but we were hoping to get back really soon and then coronavirus hit us, but there's some very active research going on in the caves of the Western Spine and the central part of, of Saudi Arabia, uh, my colleagues here in Yenna, and, uh, and some limited excavations have been going on. We've retrieved some of the fauna of these caves, and some of our colleagues uh, in mines have drilled some of these speleothems, We'll be getting high resolution environmental data out of these speleothems. And we've even done some testing of human skeletal material, mostly Holocene. Um, but we're hoping to get ancient DNA out of those as well. So, again, this is a, a collaborative project using many types of sciences to answer stories about the environmental, cultural, um, and, uh, and biological history of, of the region. The other thing that um, we're doing, we've been working uh, very much in Sri Lanka over the last few years. We have a PhD student here from Sri Lanka working on the caves of, of Sri Lanka, and we are assisting him on um, on some of these analyses, very interdisciplinary analyses. And we have some new articles coming out in the next couple of weeks. I'll save that uh, for when they do come out, but very exciting information about the last 48,000 years in Sri Lanka and how wonderful it's been to, to look at the caves of Sri Lanka, all the wonderful information about the biological history, subsistence of these hunter-gatherer groups, uh, and of course the big changes in technologies that we see. Um, besides the uh, field work in the southern dispersal zone, which has been even for me my, most of my career, we've started to work very much since we came here to Yenna, to the Max Planck, we've started to think about northern dispersals. And so together with our Mongolian colleagues, Central Asian colleagues, and Chinese colleagues, we've been thinking about um, dispersal routes, uh, publishing, just starting to publish on dispersal routes, the northern routes out of Africa, 
um, and then looking at environmental histories. And of course, these northern latitudes are very different from the southern latitudes. And ultimately, what we want to compare and contrast northern latitudes relative to the south. And finally, I just want to say that, you know, out of Africa uh, questions are, are, we're learning a lot about it. Um, we have a lot more to learn. And I will just leave you with the thought that um, I, I am really skeptical and I think we'll continue to see that the rapid coastal single migration at 60,000 years ago no longer holds, uh, that we have to be thinking about multiple dispersals, we have to be thinking about expansions of Homo sapiens, contractions and potentially extinctions, um, and we have to be thinking about how the environments integrate with this story. It is a much more complicated story than just this simple coastal movement to Australia. Uh, there's, there's, there's not only complications in terms of the inland roots of dispersals, but of course, modern humans at different times probably are meeting up with archaic populations. And this is a fascinating, much richer story about the past and about our own species that has been told before. And so I'm very happy to have, of course, been working in South Asia for so long, but also now um, uh, Arabia. And I very much look forward to working with colleagues all across the, the Northern route as well, so that we can compare the North to the South. Um, and my final, final slide, I just want to say, like the Sharma Center has been doing all this wonderful public education and outreach, we too really strongly believe in education and training and getting the scientific word out to the public. And so we've been working very hard on that as well. Um, and this is something very important. We must take our information out to the average person uh, and we've been working on that with respect to the media, some websites, and actually talking to public groups and to school children. And, 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 and this is something that Shanti and Akalesh have been putting so much effort on with respect to India. And I'm so happy to have seen what they've been doing in India. But now with a forum like this, um, you can obviously reach the world. And it's so wonderful to, to see uh, Down Ancient Trails and the, and the wonderful talk series that they have been sponsoring. And so I just want to thank not only our, our international interdisciplinary colleagues that have been working very much with us, but also the government organizations and the institutions we've been working with and those that, of course, that have permitted our work. And so thank you for listening. I'm super happy that you've all been here. I see we have a very large group of people and I'm very happy to take any question that you might have. Thank you.